Welcome and very excited tonight because I've got my dear friend Vivian McGrath. We have actually known each other since we were teenagers. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. We go back such a long way and, and I just adore this special friend of mine. And I was so grateful that she could talk tonight and share her amazing experiences and knowledge now on what you're doing around helping women and domestic violence and and basically in standing up for your rights and understanding what's going on. So fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's uh, something I've been wanting to do for a long time, but, but uh, the timing was never right. Um, if I'd sort of come out and said, I'm a domestic violence survivor, no one cared before. It was really Rosie Batty um, that made it uh, something that was very high profile and people started to take seriously. And when I heard her speak out after the horrific murder of her son by her ex, I thought now's the time. And it's, it's been amazing because a lot of my friends and closest colleagues don't even know this story. Mm. And they've been so shocked because, you know, I'm a very successful television producer and, you know, I come across as confident and strong. They go, you? You're kidding. I know. Well, that's one <laughs> thing that I just wanted to interject with you about Vivian is that she's always been that stoic rock for all of us. She's always had a beautiful kind of dependable temperament, but just kind of so easygoing and you're so clever. Oh, my gosh, could, we were all copying your assignments. It's, well, I was at school. <laughs> We had we were in a system where it was weekly, but Vivian was so bright in that front, and you went, went off then to be a journalist and very successful in journalism, and then got into TV, which was amazing, and then to kind of go into this transgression around finding who you are has been amazing to watch. Yeah, I mean, I people, what people don't realise is I started off as a young single mother because when I was uh, seven months pregnant and 21, my ex almost killed me. He strangled me and it was horrific. I really thought I was going to die on that day. And mm. this that was years of abuse. And um, so I left as a young single mother and it was, it was quite terrifying to have to face life um, alone. And um, I just thought, I have this child to live for and I have to turn my life around mm. because if I don't, the chances are I'll go back into it. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go back to him because the pull back to him was so intense or I'd go into another, another abusive relationship, which happens very, very often. And so I just wanted to break the cycle and, and I did. I'm really proud of that. It's one of the most proudest achievements of my life is that I did not pass that cycle of abuse down to my my son and um because you were so interesting because uh, just before we get on so i don't want to take up too much time but when we've just been talking recently you and our you and i about the fact that when you were 19 or 20 that i helped you pack up your stuff or you know took you to leave um your partner then and what i couldn't believe is from going from that relationship into being in a loving, amazing relationship within two years, you changed completely. Like it was, you threw yourself in so quickly for such intense personal development and you, you did it. So well done you and, and it was amazing to watch. Thank you. That's why you're here today to help us. So- um, And I now have the most incredibly gorgeous husband. It's like being the biggest love story, as you know. Gorgeous and husband, I know. <laughs> emotionally available, he's there and he's incredible. How long have you been married? Thirty years. Thirty years. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. So please yeah. now start. I know you have some questions or a series you'd like to go through, and and we've we've talked about the process. So please, where would you like to start? Yeah, I just I I wanted to talk about. Oh, sorry, if I'm rustling. Um, I just wanted to talk. I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, I have a lot of people email me and say, am I in an abusive relationship? They don't even know whether they are or not. Mm. And because emotional abuse is really, can be very, very confusing. And, you know, one woman even today wrote to me and said, look, I wish he hit me because it would be much clearer. Um, and the problem with emotional abuse is it's, you know, narcissists are incre incredibly charismatic 
you know, you remember how charismatic my ex was. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, they could, be, they could be your charming next door neighbor. They could be your boss who's the life of the party when you go out for a work drink. They, they are very, very charismatic people. And they also use highly manipulative tactics to um, shift the blame of their behavior when they start to reveal this very dark, nasty side onto you. And so you, you honestly think that maybe it's something you've done, you've caused it. And it, it really is very, very manipulative. So I just wanted to go through some of the warning signs that you are in an abusive relationship or that the person you're with has narcissistic tendencies. Right. And the first, the first one, the most deceitful um, tactic, I believe, is gaslighting. And that's where um, when you go to question um, some behaviour that you know isn't right and you think, um, you know, it's, it's... Their abuse also isn't extreme at first. They, they just show you glimmers at first. And so if you question that, they'll then say, well, that didn't happen. You imagined it. You've exaggerated. I didn't do that. And so you start to think, oh, well, maybe I did. Maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. And it's, it's, it's trying to say to you that what you're seeing and what they're telling you, there's a gulf between the two and they need you to believe that they're right. And in the end, it's you that's caused that. So mm -hmm. you start changing your behavior to try and not have that darker side come out again. Um, the next one is mirroring, where they project onto you their abuse so it's, or, or bad behaviour. So, for example, they'll say um, you're having an affair when they're the one being unfaithful or you're lying when, in fact, they're the one who's lying. Um, and it sounds, it sounds ridiculous, but, if it, I mean, look, look at what Trump's doing at the moment. It's exactly what he's doing. I didn't say that. You know, if you say it often enough, people start to believe it. Or they get you into these, I call them the crazy circular conversations from hell, where if you, again, challenge them or bring up any abusive behaviour, they then throw this smoke screen and this smoke bomb up where they're saying, uh, suddenly, you know, you, what started was a, a, a quite a benign comment that you make, suddenly gets into, morphs into... Um, questioning your friends, your families, or your beliefs that you've grown up with, and every single thing other than the fact that you're talking about their behaviour. Mm. And so you'll start thinking, how have I got from there to there? It's like arguing with somebody who's crazy. And every time you challenge them, they'll, they'll just send you down another tangent, another tangent, another tangent of completely irrelevant stuff and all about you and why you're to blame for even dare bringing it up. Or they'll make blanket statements like my ex would say, oh, you're just sport. You have a silver spoon in your mouth. Or they'll just say you're impossible to please. Or yeah. they'll put words in your mouth where they'll, where they'll say things like, oh, so you're saying you're so perfect now. You know, you're calling me the bad one. You're so perfect now. Things like that. And, and then the one I really hated was the shifting the goalposts. They mm. set these rules, one for you, one for them. And uh, you have a completely different rule. Like they can flirt with whoever they want, but if you dare flirt, well, then you're in trouble. And it's an unwritten rule. Mm. And by the time you've sort of worked out what is this rule that they're making me love, live up to? Then they just move the goalposts and then they just keep shifting them. And this is why you walk around feeling like you're on eggshells because you just don't know when they're suddenly going to explode or there's going to be a repercussion for you breaking some rule that you didn't even know was there. Um, it's, it's a really, really, I mean, I just remember always just being on eggshells and just being terrified of that. Yeah, um, are the eggshell one and it happens and I think as you said earlier like that you know it's it's much harder when they they're not hitting you in a way because there's not a physical thing but when it's passive aggressiveness where it's in the not said as well and that nearing and the twisting where you go oh is it me and you just for women 
we always see the best side of things, you know, because I know I've been mm. in abusive relationships and mm. one of them, I knew that he'd been raped as a child. So I felt so, I knew why he was like that. So I felt very, and I knew he loved me, but I thought, oh, I can fix him. <laughs> you know, like we all think we can fix them or if I can get that thing, I think that's yeah. the hard thing. And that's a really important point. You know, they, they, um, the reason you're in these relationships with them, and this is not to be, victim blaming, I, I'll preface it with that. But they do, they are, they are masters at reading people and they can detect those of us that have a, a low self-esteem. We have an inner void of not feeling good enough. And we also have a huge amount of empathy. We're the sort of people who will put others first, will put their needs and they start to play on that. So they start to give you these sob stories. You know, I had a very difficult past. My last partner um, cheated on me. I'm down and out, I've lost my job. Whatever it is that's made them hard done by or makes you feel sorry for them, you start to want to go in and rescue them because you, you think, oh, well, they're really, because you've seen, we all, you also, you, you see them as having two sides like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm. So. For example, you get the really nice side and then you'll get the nasty side. Then you'll get the nice side, then you'll get the nasty side. But you see them as having two sides. You, you, you love the nice side. You just don't like this bad side, but you still forgive them because you don't think they're responsible for that side. That's the you question. Is, rescue them. But can I ask you what I've always thought is that do you think they know or they're conscious that they're doing it? Because I go, they're not conscious that they're doing it. So it mustn't mean anything because they're doing it out of habit. Is there a consciousness to it? I don't think there is because they've got absolutely zero empathy for other people and they have no idea about the implications of their actions on others. Right. If they do, they will not take responsibility for it. But I don't believe they do because I remember... Um, getting that sense he just can't see that what he's doing this mm -hmm. manipulation and this stuff and they really do see themselves as the victim and That's that it's well, really not them yeah 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 because then how and you, do, you feel sorry for them because you you think you think that this mr evil mr or miss hyde is trapped inside this gorgeous dr jekyll and you think you know, if I can prove that I'm, I'm worthy and I, I, I love them enough, if I can show them I'm not like the girlfriends or boyfriends that came before, then they'll change and I'll rescue them and I'll, I'll bring that nice side out for good. And you wait and hope for them to change into that thing. And that's the lie. Yeah. They are the same person. Mr. Hyde or Miss Hyde is the real person. They just wear this nice mask every now and again. But it's a con. It's a con. They fool you into believing that the nice person is the real them. But actually, the nasty one is the real them. They just are good at fooling us into thinking that one day we are going to have that perfect future that they promise so beautifully together. And that, you know, and so we wait and we hope for them to change. But they're just not going to change, you know. They they're not even aware that. Well, if if they are, they're just highly manipulative, and then, you know, they don't care. They're never going to change. I don't. I, I think it's very slim, a narcissist will change. It's funny because when I finally forever. yeah, because when I finally broke up with one of them, and I, I think when my son was going to be impacted by being affected by him, you know, like there was going to something was going to happen, and I remember um, we both cried because he knew it was like a moment of he loved me. He knew that he wasn't going to change. I couldn't change him. There was that moment. But then, of course, it was horrific after that because he threatened to kill me. And, you know, but I could see that moment where he realised. So, yeah. So sorry, go on. Didn't mean to interrupt. But... No, it's all, it's all very valid what you're saying. And you really do understand it as well. And the thing is, what happens when you first meet them is they test your boundaries. You know, they test, you know, they, they, they um, detect you've got a lower self-esteem and somebody with low self-esteem is more likely to not have strong, healthy boundaries and say, no, this is not good enough because mm. we feel that we're not good enough already. You know, no wonder I was a, attracted this sort of guy because when you're low in self-worth, you attract people who 
see you as worthless. And yeah. so I was in that, that relationship. He then starts to test your boundaries. So you start to get those glimmers of the, of the bad side. And if you allow them to push those boundaries, which I did, you know, the first time he shoved me against a wall, I was really shocked. I thought, where did that come from? And then within minutes, he's crying. I'm really sorry. That's not me. I don't know what happened. I don't want to turn out like my father. And um, I then felt sorrier for him than I did for myself, having had that happen to me. And so unwittingly, I showed him I wasn't going to walk out the door. And I stayed. Wow. And I crossed a Rubicon that day. Again, I'm not victim blaming. It's just that I was in, I was insecure. I was young and secure. I didn't know how to um, say no. And I, I didn't know how to put my needs before him, you know. And so they pushed your boundaries. But that's a great point, just, I don't know if you're talking about this later, but just on the boundary stuff in relationship, and for those of you who perhaps work in, in a work situation where, you know, testing that level is to go, it's okay, to go, that's not okay, someone pushes you out of, you know, what's not appropriate, and to say it in the moment, because so, and so often you don't know of it in the moment, you think about it afterwards as well, you know. Do you, can, do you talk about that, or what advice do you have on Absolutely, that? absolutely. I mean, it, the key to all of this, um, yeah. both in a relationship with an abusive person, but also in relationships with everybody. Yeah. It's the, the, the two most important things are having a really strong sense of self-esteem. We can't change anyone or anyone, anything else around us. So you might as well stop trying. And the most important thing to do is focus on yourself and really, really build that self-esteem because if you can do that, then you can find the courage to have strong boundaries. And so once I learned that, I've applied it throughout my career. And this is why I've been really successful at work as well, because I remember the first time, you know, when you, when you learn self-esteem, you really fear confrontation. Yeah. And I was terrified. I had a boss who was, I remember him screaming at me and in, in this garage and he was really being nasty to me. And I was terrified, absolutely terrified. But I love this word responsibility. Mm. We have the ability to choose the way we respond. So we can't change other people, but we have the ability to choose the way we respond. And what I did was I just took a very deep breath because I was terrified. It was the first time I stood up for myself. And I just said to him, and, and the, I, I realized by then to not get drawn into the emotion because yeah. they'll throw these smoke bombs of emotional stuff at you. To, and narcissists do this as well, to draw you in to this argument you're never going to win. Yeah. So I remember just saying, I'm really happy to talk about this, but I'm not prepared to talk about this while you are losing your temper and raising your voice with me. So if, you are if you're prepared to be calm and have an adult conversation about it, then I'll continue. And if not, I'm going to leave and we can talk about this tomorrow. Ooh. <laughs> and, I, and, then, and then it was an incredible. It was like the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz. Is that? No. Am I crossing? No, <laughs> it is not The Wicked Witch. It is. <laughs> yeah. And That's she right. melts. It suddenly he just was shocked. He didn't know what to do. And he just melted because bullies are cowards. Narcissists and just everyday workplace bullies are cowards. And if you just stand very firm and calmly sticking to facts and no emotion, don't get caught up. And if they're saying you, 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 you can just say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I don't agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you don't get drawn into emotion. And then I walked out because he wouldn't come down. And I was shaking. I was like, oh. <laughs> but you know what? It gets easier. Once you do that the first time, it gets easier. And you just have to learn, understand what are your emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever boundaries. Because what, what is good enough for you? And I've got a series of questions, actually, that... Yeah. 
If you ask your question, I I'll go on to back. No, to that, was, that was the one thing that um, I know that I often think about is, and I know self-esteem self -esteem was everything for me when I changed because I, out of that relationship, I went, you know what? I prefer to be single than be in the wrong relationship for the rest of my life. And it was such a cathartic moment because I remember deeply feeling that. And then, of course, I went on to meet my soulmate, Maurizio, and it was only through that putting myself first on that level. But one of the things is I know the bullying that's helped me a lot when I talk about it is the fact that as soon as someone says something to you um, and if you defend or uh, justify your actions, you're in their grasp. So I think that was always something that stuck in my you're mind. Handing you're handing your power away to them. You're handing your it. So I just always remember that to not engage. Or I just go, uh-huh, okay, right, okay, you feel like that. And then you know, whatever conversation, but I, as soon as I, that pull, I'm in their trap. So that was something that yeah. helped me a lot. Yeah. That's really true and absolutely true. And I think the, the biggest, the, the, the moment that really changed my life was when I um, realized I couldn't change him. I couldn't, in my relationship, I couldn't change him. I can only change myself. Yeah. And um, to just let go to let go. I, I, there was, somebody said to me the serenity prayer. Now I'm not religious, but it was just this incredible light bulb moment when it said, um, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I thought, <laughs> I can't change him, um, but I can change I can change me. So I started, my, I have online video courses that I've created, which is uh, how to tell people how to, tr how t I take them through the steps of how I changed my life and turned it around. And I call it start, call them start with me because it all starts with you. Yeah. And, and learning how not to let your happiness depend on other people. Yeah. Um, you need to, you know, you need to be able to find the happiness within you because the rest will follow. It's incredible. It's like that beautiful song that Whitney Houston used to say about finding the love inside you. Um, and then I, I asked myself these questions. I, I, I thought, right, I'm going to ask myself this question. Do I like him? Not, not love him because I loved him. I thought I loved him. Yeah. I felt an incredible pull towards him, but I confused what love really was. Mm. Um, uh, do I like him? Does he or she um, have the same core values, beliefs and goals as you do? And when you're with them, are you being true to yourself? And are they bringing out the best in you? And are you bringing out the best in them? And are you waiting and hoping for them to change rather than loving them unconditionally for who they are right now? And when I asked myself that really honestly, I thought, I don't like him. Mm. I, we don't have these shared values, goals and dreams, and he's not bringing out the best in me. And I'm waiting and hoping for this fantasy of what we might become one day in the future to happen rather than just saying, well, what if he never changes? Mm -hmm. What if this is the best I get of him right now for the rest of my life? Will mm -hmm. I look back one day with regret? And so there, therefore I had to ask myself, is this relationship good enough for me? And do I deserve better? And now I apply those questions to everything new jobs, um, friendships, uh, you can apply them to, to everything in your life. You know, is this job really aligning, a workplace I'm in, really aligning to my true, true values, beliefs and goals? Is it bringing me, making me true to who I really am? You know, it's, they're great questions to ask, not just in relationships. And the other thing, uh, to really remember is trusting gut instincts yeah. because we lose those gut instincts when we're in abusive relationships because they um, uh, whittle away our self-esteem so much and they use these manipulative tactics so much that we start to stop trusting our gut. We believe them when they tell us where to blame and it's our fault. And so um, 
your gut instincts are the most crucial thing, you know, if they're there for a reason, they're there to protect us. And what I tell people, um, if they're scared of trusting and possibly dating again, is trust your gut and watch not what they say, but what they do. Because a narcissist or somebody abusive will promise you the, all the wonderful things in the world that you want to hear. You know, they'll say, make you feel very, very special. But what they'll do will be completely the opposite. They won't be alone. They'll be abusive. They'll, they'll say they love you, but they won't treat you in a very loving way. And when I met my husband, I was terrified. I tried to push him away. I was really scared of somebody emotionally available to me. Mm. And I just had to watch him and be still. And, and I go back, I'm sorry, I'm going round and round. I hope it's making no, sense. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. Um, it's also, well, there's also this whole concept of letting go, um, which ties into that too. If, if, if you can't change anything or anyone else around you, all, all you can focus in on is you, then you can just let go, you know, let go and trust that if it's meant to be, it will be. And, and just be still, be still, because while you're rescuing someone, trying to fix them, obsessing over them, you stop being still and you, um, you stop watching. You know, I had all the warning signs that he was no good for me. They were all there. They were screaming loudly at me and I just wasn't seeing them because I was too busy feeling sorry for him and trying to rescue him. But when you're still and you watch what they do, like I watched my, my husband now and then thought, what he's doing is what he's saying. He is there. He is turning up. He is, uh, you know, telling me, I look beautiful and then treating me like I'm lovable. And so I started to learn to relax because it's quite simple. It's really quite simple. And the other thing that happens is you see these little miracles that, that start to happen, which are the most incredible thing that ever happened to me in my life. When you're still, you let go, you trust that the best thing you can do is just focus on you, your self-esteem, your well-being and walk a straight, honest line that's totally true to your core values, beliefs, and goals, then the rest will come. And you start to see these little miracles. A person who comes into your life that tells you something you're meant to hear and you learn something about yourself. You might have an unpleasant experience, but that could be a mirror being held up to you as a lesson you need to learn about something else about yourself. Or you might have you know, an opportunity that comes your way and it's the one you're meant to, 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 to do. It might fall, fall apart and you think, oh my God, that's a disaster. But then had you not done that, it didn't lead to the next thing that was meant to be. So that's how I live my life. And I love that. It's, I mean, my yeah. life has changed as a result. Look, it is the stillness. Um, it's so interesting because I know that when I was in that place of, you know, not knowing what to do. And I know when you want to leave, but you can't. So you actually, for me, the biggest thing that has helped create change and my ability to leave is to actually give up something. So for example, I know it sounds crazy, but I knew I wouldn't meet my soulmate unless I gave up smoking. This was, you know, um, like 15 years ago. But there's something, and I think if you can get into that place, if you're in a relationship and it's so much easier in one way to stay there, that you go, if I want something new, I'm gonna have to give up or let go, as you say, of something and then miracles happen. Yeah. So I love that. Is there, before we open up for any questions, have you, is there yeah, anything? I'm just, saying, I'm just saying that people want other, want to hear from other people. So yes. Oh yes. Okay. So and any thank other you very much for your lovely comment there. That yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Barring intelligent woman, love listening here. She should be an advocate in seminars. I feel every word, but other people. Well, I am hoping to do that actually. And I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, already in discussion about hopefully doing a TED talk. Which I'm yes, which would be amazing. So is there, if we have no other questions um, that we'd like to ask? Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Please fire them away I mean, at me. I wanted to talk, I mean, if it, while we're waiting, if anyone wants to ask anything, but um, so for when you went through it, I think that is the hardest thing is to actually leave that that's, that's the big thing is making that decision to go. And a lot of the time 
people, you know, I remember, I think you were, we're in my kitchen and my husband said, why do women stay? He's, don't, well, I don't understand. Like, and I could really see he didn't understand. And, and fortunately, yeah. because I'd been in a relation, I understood that because I went, I can fix him or I can change him or he's heartbroken because of all the damage mm. that's been done to him. How do you get into that? What's there any other way that you can remove yourself apart from, because some people don't understand the stillness. They don't understand is there any other very practical or um, any, any yeah, other? I mean, yeah, why women stay? Yeah, exactly. Well, I've got no bones about this because they target people who are very low self-esteem, yeah. who will put them others, others first, as I described before. Then they set you up by testing your boundaries to see whether you're somebody who they can push and manipulate. Once they've done that and tested and, and, and set the rules of the game, which is you're going to take the blame for everything that they do and what goes wrong in the relationship, then they start to groom you. And they start to groom you in the way, same way the paedophiles do. With all of those manipulative tactics, I haven't described them all, but um, uh, uh, we get we do get groomed and it is one of the hardest things I've ever done was leaving an abusive relationship because you also develop an unhealthy addiction to them because the cycle of abuse goes from nice to nasty nice to nasty nice to nasty and you're hoping and waiting for them to change you think that if you can just change your behavior then you'll make it go away and you'll get them back and it's you 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 just crave that nice side so much that yes. the only one, you, and you've got no self-esteem by now because they've chipped away at it and chipped away at it, that by the time um, you've been in the relationship a while, the only person who can make yourself feel good again uh, is them. It's like heroin right, right, addict. Right, right. So right. I would say the way to get, the, the best way to do it is to go cold turkey like an addict. If you can go cold turkey and just cut all contact that's what i had to do because and i had a child so if you have a child you then have to deal through a third party not directly because the more contact you have the more you're going to be exposed to their manipulation and the more you're going to crave going back to them because you know just with one nice word and hug and i'm sorry i didn't mean it you'll feel so good about it and again because you know, I didn't want to leave. I loved him and I wanted us to. So when he just said, I'm, I'm going to change, I believed him, you know. Um, so Melissa's asking about bullying in the workplace. I, th I thought we did talk about that. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that. We'll come back to that one. I just, because um, we touched on that, but I love, <laughs> what if the narcissist is your mother? How do you... Well, you know, you know, it's very common um, for, I, I believe my mother has narcissistic traits and it's very common for people who are daughters um, of narcissists. In fact, there's a book I read about daughters of narcissistic mothers. I'm, I've just finished reading that, actually. Mm. And quite often you go into uh, an abusive relationship that's similar with a narcissist because you've been brought up by one. Um, I don't have so much contact now. Um, and I manage it. Uh, on my terms, I guess. There was a change for you because I remember watching from the outside because where, as soon as you, you've you kept a kind of a, a very healthy boundary with her, but you realised, as soon as you realised it was her actually that was yeah. causing the issue and that took a while, yeah? It did. It did. And actually, weirdly, it's only because I've been writing my book that mm. it's all just come back about my childhood. You know, I was talking to a woman the other day, Yvonne, and she has cut contact with her mother because she said, it's not good enough for me, that relationship, and it's not bringing out the best, you know. You don't owe your mother anything. Yeah, yeah. We don't get asked to be born. We don't owe them anything. And yeah. if she's not bringing out the best in you, if she's hurting you, well, then why not consider cutting contact? Or, or you know... Um, Showing her by your behaviour when she isn't nice to you, you will pull back. Yeah. When yeah. she behaves nicely, she can have your attention. You know, you do the talk to the hand bit. 
Yeah, that's a great one where you just, um, which I've done um, and a friend has done, where it's like as soon as they start just going, I've got to go now, you know, just this mm. is not appropriate conversation or just got to go. And they soon go, oh, and they get that message. Yeah. Um, and, what, and someone's worried about um, the effect of Narc X is having on your son. Yes, I know a lot, there's a lot of women who speak to me about this. Um, I think that um, what you're saying is exactly right. You lead by example. I think kids are pretty smart, actually. I made a decision when I left that I was never going to say a bad word about my ex to my son because I felt that um, his relationship with his father is not my relationship with my ex. So I did not say a bad word about him. And... Um, my, my son has made his own mind up because he's, he's heard, you know, unpleasant things from my um, ex and he's never heard me behave in a way, you know, like that before. And so he has made that choice. I think you just have to lead by example. You have to just keep always, you know, going back to what your core beliefs and goals are and try not to get caught up in the manipulation if your son is copying that behaviour. And, and as I was talking about before in bullying in the workplace, you know, don't get caught up into emotional discussion or argument. Just keep, you know, keep it very calm and polite and stick to facts or just say, I don't agree. Um, I can get into a circular discussion and argument about it. Because my um, husband works with teenagers, so with mental health and a lot of kids who are in that position. And I know because I've been across it all and it's great having a male mentor if you can find that that helps you do mm. role models some great behaviours. Uh, very hard when it's you because I know the triggering happens as well when you're in, you know, in that relationship where you feel... God, I, I need to spurt back and it's about you then, how you are. So exactly what you're saying is, is just being great leadership. But yes, I think that was great advice hearing about getting a mentor, a male mentor that can help. That's a great idea, actually, because yeah. I've been very lucky that when I met my husband, who I'm still with now, he has been an incredible role model. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult in my son's teenage years. He would tell him to fuck off and he would... Uh, say you're not my father and he'd push him away and it was very very difficult we had some very difficult times and then there was you know um but my husband was just there consistent consistent respectful um kept strong boundaries boundaries uh, melissa that's the other thing um boundaries are really really important um with your son as well now the author book about narcissistic mothers let me just go and grab it because i can't remember it from top of um, what we were just talking about too with the um mel around the bullying in the workplace was really about just which touched on earlier was to again boundaries as we we're just talking about also not engaging and i think that's really important is because as soon as you justify or defend yourself uh, you're hooked into that whole conversation so if something's inappropriate yeah just to say, look, I don't think that's an appropriate question or I'd like to discuss it with my, your, you know, your boss together or your whoever uh, looks after you, your superintendent. That's the better way rather than trying to manage it yourself because you're in a workplace, you know, there are people and go to HR if there's any issues as well. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that in a yeah. sec, but this is the book. Yes. It's called Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Uh, Healing the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers and it's called by Carol... McBride. Um, I'll just type that in the message here. And I'll put it on the final post because we'll put this webinar up on my um, yeah, blog. That, that's the name of the author. Yeah, it's called Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Healing the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers. Um, yeah. Great. And actually, I go into a lot of this. Uh, I'm, I've just finished the manuscript yeah. for my book. So tell me about, because we'll have to finish up, we're a little bit over, but there's so much to talk about. Um, tell me... Uh, oh, I'm just going back about that bullying one. Um, yes, what yes, was yes. I going to add to that? Um, 
if so, if you are if you if you suffer like sexual harassment or bullying or something yeah. extreme in the workplace then what i would do is um uh, stand your ground very calmly and politely just say i'm not going to have this conversation if there's if they're raising their voice until you calm down um if they start accusing you of X, Y, and Z, you just say, I don't agree. I'm sorry you feel that way, but I don't agree. So they own their behavior. Um, and I would also put in writing, as soon as it's happened, go back to your desk, put it in writing and, and date it, put the time, the date, record it. Yeah, and right. also speak to anybody else. If anybody else witnessed it, get them to put record it and then go to HR. If you can't deal, you know, there's, there's you, you could calmly confront them and, and, and express your, you know, dissatisfaction for the way they're behaving because they might not know that they're behaving like that. They might not know they're crossing your boundaries, but if they do and you don't feel confident that you can confront them, then I would have it in writing, record it, dates, times, write it and go to the HR and speak to them about it. Fantastic. And the one little thing, because I've just done, you know, those videos and I interviewed the HR and saw a lawyer from Human Rights, which I didn't know you can go outside your workplace to record yeah. to actually get help, which I had no idea. In fact, there's helplines. There's helplines. Um, Fantastic. Uh, I, I have to give them to you later, but there are, there are places yeah. you can go. I'll put them um, down the bottom on the link after because there's... Yeah. Uh, Yes, I didn't know that you can actually get someone to come and investigate on your behalf. I think it's a quality in the workplace sort of uh, uh, organisation. There, there are these places you can go. Beautiful. So what are you, now tell us, Steve, what are you doing? So you've got some courses. You're writing a book, of course. We're waiting to... Well, that. I've got my blog, I've got my blog which is yes. being, beingunbeatable.com. Yes. And I'm, I'm on there. I post uh, every week, if not um, more. And on every post, I do a video. So there's lots and lots and lots of free content that, that will help you if you're interested. Then I also have, um, and there's also a quiz on there that you can do a free quiz that says, is your relationship good enough for you? And you can do that quiz, an online quiz and find out. Um, there's online video courses, uh, which, which I've created um, to help people go from victim to survivor, from survivor to staying strong, you know, which is that really crucial time when you're leaving an abusive relationship and still struggling and getting sucked back in and being pulled back into them. Yeah. And that course is very much about how to break the cycle so you don't go back to them or into another abusive relationship. So I've got the online video courses and I am about to start a um, video podcast. My first interview will be with Rosie Batty, which I am very excited about. Yeah, and I've just finished the manuscript for my book, which is called oh. Unbeatable, Unbeatable, How I Left a Violent Man. And it's, it's my memoirs. And wow, that's been an amazing journey, just writing that. And um, very cathartic. I've cried a lot through it I've learned a lot about myself even more than I thought and I'm peeling those onion layers off yes. and uh, it's been an incredible ride and I'm really proud of it so that's going to be published very soon and um, if you're on my blog then you'll I'll be shouting to the rooftops about that when it comes out. Well congratulations. You yeah. sort of helped me with some of the memories as well, so thank you for that. Oh, no, my pleasure. Well, it's just been wonderful to watch you go through the whole, from writing the book through to this stage has been a dramatic transformation and uh, it's been gorgeous to watch and thank you for sharing everything tonight and, and just, you know... Well, I'm actually also working on a film. I'm working on a film called yeah. Fifty Shades of Silence. Now, if anybody out there or if any of you know anybody out there who's been the victim of cyber assault, cyber bullying, revenge porn, which, you know, cyber abuse is very topical at the moment with that, that young girl killing herself oh, very oh, tragically. Oh, uh, horrible. Um, we have a website. That's another website called Fifty Shades of Silence. And that's, uh, we are making a film at the moment um, on that. So that website has resources that will help you um, if you need help in that sort of um, area. Fantastic. So, 
Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, we're being on beautiful.com. Please join me yes. there. I'd love yes. to. And we'll put all the uh, URLs below. I'll put get this up by tomorrow and it will be recorded so you can look back at it again because there's so much information in there. Thank you, Viv. You spoke about thank it you. beautifully, so articulate. And um, thank you. And uh, good night to everybody. Thank you for being and listening and, and being there. Yes. And if anyone wants any further support, I've also yes. got a, a, I've got a closed um, Facebook group and oh. there's a lot of my former students in there, lots of people who are going through what you're going through right now. And they're, they're, they're lovely. They all support each other. And I'm in there a lot um, chatting. And we'll put that them. link below too. Yeah. So you can find it. Okay. Yeah. See you. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye. Lots of love. Bye.